recording now. And uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Tom Ankner. I am the director of the Charles F. Cummings New Jersey Information Center at the Newark Public Library. Uh, today's program is a virtual book talk with the authors of A Mayor for All the People. Uh, the book was published by Rutgers University Press in November. Uh, it's a sort of oral history of the mayoralty of Kenneth Gibson, Newark's first African-American mayor. 2020 marks the 50th anniversary of Gibson's election. Uh, let me begin by introducing the two authors of A Mayor for All the People. Oh, and I also want to say that most people's audio is um, muted for now. I'm going to change that when the question and answer period uh, begins. I just don't want a lot of crosstalk, so I'm just put everyone on mute. Um, and I'll also put people's videos on so they can actually raise their hands, ask a question too. Uh, so anyway, let me begin by introducing the two authors of The Mayor for All the People. I want to get their full names right, Robert C. Holmes and Richard W. Roper. Uh, so Robert C. Holmes is uh, a clinical professor of law at Rutgers University. He served in the Gibson administration as executive director of the Newark Housing Development and Rehabilitation Corporation, then was later named executive director of the Newark Watershed Conservation and Development Corporation. Uh, he has also served as assistant commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs and as a partner in the law firm Willentz, Goldman and Spitzer. Uh, Richard W. Roper is a policy consultant whose many positions in local, state, regional, and federal government agencies also included uh, director of the program for New Jersey Affairs and assistant dean of Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. He later served as planning department director at the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey and as a senior fellow at the Rockefeller Institute of Government at the State University of New York. So... Bob and Richard, thank you very much for agreeing to do this, and um, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. Uh, okay, so now you both worked for the Ken Gibson early in your careers, um, right around the time that he became mayor, I believe. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it was about Gibson that made you want to work for him? Bob, why don't we start with you? Well, I have uh, coined the phrase, I'm not sure I'm the original author of this, but I claim it, I call it Gibson University. So I went to Cornell University as an undergraduate, went to Harvard Law School as a law student, and uh, was recruited out of Harvard Law School to Newark to what I think is as much a part of my education as any of the others that I just described to you. I was young, right out of law school, a gentleman whose name will not be unfamiliar to most of you, Junius Williams, who had run the Gibson campaign uh, in 1970 and came on as director of Model Cities, which was almost as highly funded as the city itself, uh, was out on a recruiting mission to find young talent to come into the Gibson administration. Uh, I thought of myself as a, an activist of sorts, at least in the then Roxbury, Massachusetts area when I was at Harvard Law School. So being uh, asked to join an administration in Newark coming out of the ashes of uh, the 1967 riots seemed like a terrific place for me to try out some of the things I had been trying to learn uh, in my days uh, during uh, both college and law school. So Junius was successful in bringing me uh, into the city uh, of Newark in 19, in my case, in the first uh, 71, early, early part of 1971. Oh, okay, okay. My, my story is uh, uh, quite similar, quite frankly, to uh, Bob's with the uh, exception of my having gotten my undergraduate degree at uh, Rutgers in uh, Rutgers University in Newark. I graduated in 1968 and then uh, worked for the uh, Chancellor of Higher Education, Ralph Dungan, for a year before going to Princeton to get my uh, master's degree at the Woodrow Wilson School. And during my second year at the Wilson School, Bob Kirvin began working on his PhD there. Bob had been very active in Newark, had participated in the um, Black and Puerto Rican um, convention and had been a close advisor to a lot of the political, black political leadership in the city of the time. Anyhow, Bob approached me about coming back to Newark once I completed my uh, graduate program to uh, join the Gibson administration and I thought about it after having met the mayor and decided that I would in fact do that. Uh, having worked in the Newark community as an undergraduate while at Rutgers Newark, I had gotten to know many of the actors who were involved in uh, the uh, campaign 
1970 and was energized by the fact that King had been elected and wanted to be a part of this, what I considered a groundbreaking event, the election of the region's first African-American mayor. Okay, okay. So Bob, in your preface to the book, uh, you described Gibson's election as mayor of Newark as a watershed event. Um, in what ways? We'll talk a little well, bit about the uh, format. Oh, okay, anyway, in what ways? I was trying, it's in my semi-scholarly way, to distinguish watershed from historic. And in watershed, I, I suggested anything that changed the way people thought about things would constitute a watershed event. Uh, it certainly changed the way the electorate was thinking about Newark. They went from uh, historically electing white mayors to finally electing an African-American mayor. So it certainly was a watershed event in that regard. My uh, further scholarly inquiry was whether it actually rose to the level of a historic event, which I think takes on a, a different uh, set of tests than simply being a watershed event. When Adonisio left Congress, and came to Newark to be the mayor, I thought that was also a watershed event. Uh, when Lou Danzig became the director of the Housing Authority, that was a watershed event because each of those events changed the way Newark Newark's history was being written, not necessarily historic in nature, but certainly watershed events in, in each case. So I thought about the election itself certainly as a watershed event and then went on to inquire whether I thought it was also an historic event. Okay, all right. Um, can you talk a little bit about the format of the book? Uh, it's like a series of reminiscences written by several different people. Why was that format chosen? Either one of you can. can... Let me take a stab at that, Bob, and then you can add on. Uh, we wanted to, um, initially we were gonna write an article for Governing Magazine about um, the uh, 50 year, about, about the events of 50 years prior to the book's publication, 1970. And we wanted to talk at length about uh, Ken's role in Newark, about the city of Newark at that time, what, um, what was taking place then and what transpired shortly thereafter over the next, um, what, 16 years, the period that Ken was, was in office. As we got involved in thinking about it, the, the we in this instance is Bob Holmes, George Hampton initially, and then I joined the group uh, subsequently. Um, we began to think that we might have more than a, uh, a magazine article uh, before us and indeed began to think about inviting others to join us in what we thought was a worthwhile contribution uh, to the public discourse and that was by identifying individuals who had been active in one way or another in and around Newark in that, during that period. Individuals who had worked for the mayor, individuals who were supportive of the mayor but were not a part of the administration, people who were critical of Ken Gibson and what he sought to do, uh, as well as uh, friends and family members. We reached out to some 48, almost 50 people and asked if they would be willing to submit reflections of three to five pages in length uh, to help us pull together this uh, um, tapestry, if you will, of what, uh, what the Gibson period in Newark looked like. You wanna add, Bob? Well, only to say that what it suggests, and it, it, it leads me to suggest what the book is not. It's not intended to be uh, an authorized biography. We didn't right. attempt to simply describe the legacy and life of Ken Gibson, even during those 16 years. We looked and said at the city of Newark, influenced by the election of its first African-American mayor. So we looked at the man, of course, but we also looked at the time that he served and, and the city in which he served. So we wanted reflections, not through a scripted interview about what people thought about Ken Gibson, but their experience in the city of Newark during that period, 1970 to 1986. You'll find when you read the book that much of it in their own words sounds autobiographical by them. They're talking about themselves. They're not necessarily saying, I thought of Ken Gibson as they're saying, when I was in Newark, I. So they talk more about themselves, but through that, that lens or through the 50 lenses, 
you were able to get a very clear picture of what was going on in the city and how that city was influenced by that particular man named Kenneth Gibson at the time. Mm -hmm. it was, it, we, we wanted to make the point that this is um, a portrait that's painted by the people who were actually present. It's not uh, a historical a scholarly document. It's a, uh, a collection of reflections with uh, a, an introductory section that sets the context for the work and a concluding section that looks across those reflections to try and paint a tapestry, if you will, that um, sort of clearly reflects uh, the, the perspectives of those who were involved. Tom, I just might add one other point to that. Uh, as my afterward suggests, uh, I, I was inspired and informed by a West African, we might be familiar with the West African tradition, the griots who were the the memory uh, people in the community whose responsibility it was to hand down that community's memory. But well, Richard and I certainly didn't think our particular memories were enough. What you have is a collective memory. So we have 50 contributors to that griot tradition of trying to find that collective memory and hand it down to generations to follow. Okay. Right. So in the book, Bob, you write the introduction and Richard, you wrote the conclusion. Uh, the introduction poses the question, how should we measure the historical significance of the Kenneth Gibson era in Newark? Um, Richard, did you come up with an answer to that question? I mean, I read it, but I want you to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, we conclude that, um, that Gibson uh, was a unique figure in the history of the city of Newark, that he made substantial, important contributions to the city of Newark. And if you look at what he was able to accomplish given the period during which he was in office and the challenges he confronted, that his contributions are probably described as historic. Uh, Bob has a lot to say about how other mayors who are regarded as major contributors to their community are designated uh, historical. And he can say a bit about that. But looking at what Ken was able to contribute the extent to which he brought young uh, professionals from across the et uh, ethnic spectrum into his administration and gave them positions of uh, significant responsibility. Uh, the extent to which he focused on the uh, area of health care and the delivery of health care services in, in Newark. The extent to which he sought to bring innovative approaches to addressing the problems, uh, the challenges that the city confronted, uh, that too, I think, would cause us to regard his tenure in office as historic, as a historic period. Bob? Yeah. Oh, I looked at many uh, perspectives on that. Time Magazine, Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic Magazine, a pen study uh, in, invited historians to give tests for what would constitute an historic figure, for example, did the person have a peculiar personality that was unique for the particular time? They use Abraham Lincoln from the Civil War, George Washington during the Revolutionary War. Uh, the reflections clearly suggest that the demeanor and personality of Ken Gibson was perfectly suited for a city coming out of one of the worst uh, periods of its history, the 1967 riots. Uh, so he, historians would say, yes, he was peculiarly suited for the particular time. Did he leave lasting evidence of his presence here? These are some of the tests. I won't go through them all, but as I went through the historian's tests for what would make someone a historic figure, Ken Gibson matched it one time after another and clearly was. My favorite, uh, the Penn study, uh, sought to, to have historians suggest who they thought was the most important mayor of all time, and they chose Fiorello LaGuardia. The question was, why would it be him? It wasn't about the programs he advanced. It wasn't about the policies. It was because he changed the perception in New York about what the Italian community could do in terms of good governance. There was a perception of what Italians in New York were. Uh, we won't suggest what that perception was, but he changed that perception that they could be good managers and good governors. Ken Gibson came along with another ethnic group, African Americans, and had to do the same thing. He had to change deeply rooted perceptions about what African-Americans were capable of doing in the areas of management and government and governance. 
Uh, and I think that uh, among all of the other tests would probably best suggest his legacy and why he is clearly a historic figure. Uh, he did change that perception as evidenced by the fact that we've had an African-American mayor in that city ever since, uh, coming through Sharp James, Cory Booker, and Aras Baraka. Okay, all right. So one of the chapters in the book is an interview with Gibson. You both sat down and interviewed him. Um, describe that experience. I mean, what, and what was, what was his reaction to this book, uh, or to the idea of the book? And um, I know when I, when I read the interview, he seemed a little defensive about his legacy. Um, was that, was, is that, I mean, that came across in the way the interview was written. Was he like that in person too? Go ahead, Bob. Yes. <laughs> and I think it is in part why the book was written. It is inspired in part by that uh, defensiveness. That interview that you alluded to was not the first conversation we had with Ken about the book. The, the first conversations occurred three years prior to us writing the book when Ken was talking about why people were not giving a more uh, balanced view of him, of him and his legacy. He had read other people's books and he was given, he didn't disagree with what they were saying, by the way. He simply thought the views weren't balance. We know some of the books. Bob Curvin wrote an interesting book. Junius Williams wrote a book. And they talk about Ken Gibson, mostly in the negative. Uh, and he says, maybe they're right, but somebody needs to bring some of the rest of the story to, to the fore. So yes, I think he started our journey on this book being defensive about what he saw uh, his legacy was going to be and encouraged us uh, at the time, George Hampton and I, who were having that meeting with him, to, to go about trying to put more on the table, more about him on the table, so people could see a more balanced view. So I think that carry forward, uh, unfortunately, he never got to see the book. Uh, so yeah. we don't know what his reaction would be to what we see as the 40 or 50 people talking about him. Uh, but I think he would be pleased to know that we have that many different perspectives now about him and about his legacy. Right. Yeah, just to point out to people that he did die, he, uh, Gibson died a little over a year ago, in March of the year. About, for, about, for the book about, about six yeah. months before the book was yeah. published, uh, came out of uh, publication. Yeah. The, um, the, the, the idea of doing this, however, I think originated with a um, gathering that took place at uh, Professor Clement Price's house in Newark, where Gibson was the featured speaker and a seven, about 16, 17 African-American professionals, guys who had been around a long time, which is to say they were pretty old, um, were in attendance and had an opportunity to interact with uh, Ken about uh, issues that uh, they felt were either important or had not been addressed uh, by the others who had written about uh, Newark and about Ken's role in Newark. And as a result of our having been party, a party to that meeting, Bob, George, myself, uh, the idea of writing something initially for a magazine uh, and then subsequently to make it into a volume of, of some substance uh, emerged. Yeah, I might just add to that, Tom, two of the people at that meeting were Bob Curvin and Junius and Williams, who had written books about the time, yeah. the place, and the man. And I think it, it, it's a credit to them that they were willing still and open-minded enough to come to that uh, meeting at Clem Price's house in Ken Gibson's presence and have a more open dis discussion and dialogue in his presence about what his uh, legacy is and should be. Junius Williams, by the way, is one of the individuals providing reflections in the volume. Unfortunately, Bob Curvin had uh, passed as we had died before we were able to uh, uh, get the book uh, completed. Okay. All right. So um, one of the things you ask him about in the interview is his temperament. And there's a lot of talk about Gibson's you know, temperament. Uh, he was known for being a methodical guy, a very low key. Um, and I think you even ask him in the interview, is temperament important? Um, wh why is that so important when with Gibson? It, the issue of the issue of temperament. I, I think um, in the first instance, it's um, an indication of what Newark felt it needed 
three years after the, um, the rebellion. The city was uh, suffering still in dramatic ways from having gone through uh, that week long period of, um, of uh, civil unrest, if you will. And Gibson trained as an engineer was methodical in his approach to issues. He was calm and laid back in his temperament. Um, some would say he was a bit phlegmatic, uh, but the bottom line is that he brought a calmness to the task of trying to um, move the city forward in a way that would be beneficial, not only to uh, the African-American community of which he was a part, but of all the people of Newark, ergo the title of uh, the volume, A Mayor for All the People. Ken very much wanted to be seen as someone who was leading a city on behalf of all of its constituents. Mo many of those constituents were not on board with his leadership, but that was beside the point. He saw himself as um, a leader of Newark's uh, entire population. That quote, a mayor for all the people, comes from him, right? That was a quote of Gibson's, wasn't it? From yes, his... it is. Yeah. In fact, yeah. he yes. refers to that in his, uh, in his yeah. part of the reflection. Uh, and I think it first was said in his inaugural speech yeah. and began to turn away some of his most avid supporters, like Amiri Baraka, Oliver Lofton, Bob Curvin. They thought he was elected through a Puerto Rican and, and Black a convention and that he should have made some gesture that he would be give special consideration to those populations. He pushed back against that saying no. And it was specifically not just a throwaway campaign line. It was a response to them when he said, no, I am the mayor for all the people. Uh, that was a very big turnoff and unfortunately cost him a many, num many of his best supporters uh, right from that very beginning. So um, let's talk a little bit about the, the various um, ethnic groups. There's um, uh, ethnic racial groups in the city and their reaction to um, Gibson. Um, his name was first put forward for mayor at the Black and Puerto Rican Convention in 1969. Uh, and a lot of the uh, Latinos who were active in helping to get him elected um, you alluded to this, um, to various groups. So a lot of the Latinos felt that he didn't really um, help them as much as they were hoping they would be helped after he became mayor. Isn't that, isn't that true? Yeah, the Puerto Rican community felt that, um, that uh, the election of 1970 did, did not serve them well. They were uh, very active in supporting uh, the election of the city's first African-American mayor, and they felt that they should be a part of that through uh, the election of the first uh, Latinx to the New York City Council. Uh, unfortunately, that individual um, uh, did not, that Puerto Rican candidate did not uh, survive the election um, and did not become a member of the council. Subsequent to that, the mayor uh, elected to hire a Puerto Rican as a deputy mayor, but it was perceived by the Latino community as being uh, less than substantial in substance and they felt that um, they had been uh, mistreated, if you will, by the black community. First, because the black community, the African-American community had not supported the uh, Latinx candidate for the city, city council. And then Gibson uh, appeared not to take them seriously by appointing um, representatives of their community to substantial positions in his administration. Um, that attitude, uh, about the mayor was exacerbated um, during his first full term in office when there was a riot um, or an up uprising or rebellion of a mini rebellion, if you will, in Branchbrook Park involving Puerto Ricans and the Newark's uh, police, uh, police department, police officers. Uh, that resulted in the mayor uh, trying to address verbally the concerns of the Puerto Rican community, but apparently not to the Puerto Rican community's uh, satisfaction. 
there was a continued uh, unhappiness with the, uh, the mayor's ability or willingness to address their concerns. That continued throughout his uh, uh, four years, four terms in office. Okay. Did you want to add anything, Bob? Well, maybe just this, you talk about fuel to that fire while he was downplaying his uh, commitment and loyalty to the Hispanic community, he was giving more deference to Steve Adubato in the North Ward, uh, a the heartbeat of, heartbeat of, of the Italian community, which many thought was exactly contrary to what he should be doing since that was the community that had not supported him. So mm -hmm. the Hispanic community were getting short shrift and he seemed to be giving uh, an excessive amount of attention and resources to a community that others thought uh, should not be receiving it. Although, to, in fairness, Steve Adubato had gone far, far out on a limb in his own community to support Ken Gibson in that election. So you might say that was the reward he, he deserved. So whether it was he as an individual or his community, there is some controversy. I won't go into the details we know about Kawaita Towers and the attempts to build a high rise building in the North Ward and the kind of pushback that came from that. So that tension was always there. And yet there seemed to be a better relationship between Ken and that community than between Ken and, and the Hispanic community. In fact, I mean, the, the, the case can be made that uh, uh, the relationship that um, had developed between Ken and black political leadership in the city, the black power movement constituency, if you will, uh, was dissipated in large measure because of Ken's uh, efforts to establish a strong working relationship with the um, Italian community through uh, Steve Adubato. There was great resentment about uh, Ken's extending his hand of cooperation and collaboration uh, with, uh, with Steve and that resentment uh, uh, caused the relationship between Ken and uh, the um, Black Power Movement segment of the, of the Black political community uh, to be uh, weakened. Can I, can I jump in here for a minute, uh, Steve, uh, Richard? Sure. Uh, Is that Sam Conzifer? That's, Conzifer? That's, Conzifer? That, that's Sam Conzifer. Sam right? How are you? <laughs> I'm well, thank you, Richard. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Uh, um, I met I was with an organization called the Greater Newark Development Council, which consisted of the 18 largest corporations in the city of Newark. And they were really a government in exile in, 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 to a great extent. I, the exile, <coughs> not that they were opposed to, to, um, to Carlin and Adonisio at the time. They, they were for Carlin and walked out to when Adonisio won. But, but, they were very close to Lou Danzig, and Lou was, of course, in the head of the housing authority, and Lou was also the, uh, in the housing authority, had responsibility for the industrial development in the city and urban renewal. So Ken worked for Lou and uh, as assistant planner, and there was a planner on the staff of the Greater Newark Development Council, um, a fellow by the name of Ibrahim Elsamak. And uh, he was a very prominent, very good planner. And he worked with, with Ken. And he, 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 the two of them were, were very good. And Ken was in the office very often. And that's when I first got, got to meet Ken. And uh, the night of the, the um, election of, the, of Ken, as from the uh, from the political uh, uh, convention, the Black and Puerto Rican political convention, uh, I got a call about 10:30 that night from Ken, and he wanted to come up and see me. And I was, you know, 10:30 at night. I was no longer working in Newark. I was with a corporation in New York, and. Um, I, my wife would happen to be pregnant. I said, well, you know, it's kind of late and this, that, and the other. He said, no, I'll be quick. He said, so he's coming, he comes up. And I remember him coming up to my house. I was living in South Orange at the time. And he <laughs> comes up and 
I don't remember who the third person was, but he, he came up with Earl Harris. And uh, that, that disturbed me a little bit because Earl, I knew from the Adonisio administration, I had worked with Adonisio for a year and a half or two years or so. And, uh, and I, I kind of knew what Earl was about at this, in, in Adonisio's office. And anyway, what Ken wanted from me was to see if I could help him raise some money from the business community in Newark. And uh, because I had worked with them for the, all these years. And uh, I said I would try. And uh, next day or so, I put in a call to the fellow by the name of Henry Connor, who worked for, who was the head of the, uh, the business community group. And uh, Henry was uh, agreed to that. And I, if I'm not mistaken, Alan Lowenstein was part of that also. And we raised a little over $100,000 for Ken for that campaign. And, um, and then the, I had a couple of meetings in my home uh, with suburban people who were very interested in supporting Ken for the, for the mayorality. And uh, we did it. And another person that, who, who you haven't mentioned yet, I think it was terribly important in Ken's development was Larry Goldman. Larry was head of a of a uh, Ford Foundation program at Princeton University that was uh, uh, came out of Princeton and Ford Foundation uh, gave some money I don't know where I guess it was to a group that Larry put together to serve as as uh, consultants to Ray to uh, to Ken in the campaign and Larry was at some of my some of my programs or, or meetings that I had to raise money for him. And he and I put together a couple of good sessions where we raised some money for Ken and gave him a sense of what it's all about uh, in, in just generally in terms of Newark and his position with the county and what have you. And I think maybe that's what, if, if, if you want to find or find fault with that, I never heard from Bob Curvin, Bob um, Curvin never expressed it to me, and we were good friends, that he felt that the disappointment in, in Ken's uh, uh, not putting more attention on the Black and Puerto Rican communities in Newark. And Sam, maybe- did, did, Sam, did you, did you, have you read Bob's book? I read Bob's book, yes. And much. you don't think it's critical of Ken? Oh, it is critical. Yeah, oh. it is critical. I said, I can. Bob Curvin never expressed it to me. I see. Uh -huh. I never. I was surprised when I read it uh -huh. that, he felt, that he felt that way because yeah. I was a good friend of 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 uh, Bob's, and uh, we were close, and we talked about this over the years. And I don't, I don't recall him ever saying that. I'm just saying, listening to you talk, all of you talk here. I, I I wonder whether how much of this this suburban input, if you will, <laughs> that I was giving Ken <laughs> may have carried over to a point where he said this is more fun than the other side of my problem. <laughs> so, Could be. So I don't know if that that came to play. That's what I wanted. To gotcha. Okay, I just wanted to let everybody know that I'm trying to unmute you all so you can ask questions. If anybody has a question, just um, come forward. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question for Bob or Richard? I, I've been on mute, so I've been on, on Zoom so many times this week for other things. So yeah. well, have we all. Yeah, we're all. We're all on Zoom a lot these days. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, George, go ahead. George, you have a question? George Holly, you have a question? I'm, I'm wondering how the panel feels about Ken uh, versus Sharp James who succeeded him. I once saw Sharp James talking to a, a, a librarian at the library and, and Sharp came on so strong that the, the librarian got completely flustered. Uh, uh, was Ken's uh, personality perhaps more effective in appearing to be sincere, or, or is it important for a, a mayor to, to come on uh, extremely enthusiastic and uh, you know, very, very promoting? Yeah, I, I think the big difference between Sharp and Ken uh, is that Ken was, as, we, as we've already stated, very laid back, uh, very um, calm, 
uh, of diplomatic, if you will, in, in much of his interaction with the larger community. Sharp on the Ken was de de devoted to Newark. There's no question about that. But his devotion was a calm, quiet devotion. He was able to work with people like Sam Cantavere. Uh, <laughs> I'll get it right in a minute. Conversor. <laughs> Conversor. Uh, and the suburban um, uh, residents uh, uh, around Newark. Sharp, on the other hand, was very visceral in his support uh, of the city of Newark. He was a booster. He saw himself as occupying a, a bully pulpit, if you will, on behalf of the city uh, and would take no prisoners. I don't think there was a, 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 an inch of difference between them in terms of their con commitment to the city of Newark and their concern for advancing its interests. I think it's more about the style that they uh, uh, applied in, in, um, in demonstrating that commitment. I think never showed up at the meeting we had with 300 people came. I, I, I agree with that. I would add, I think Ken's demeanor, as opposed to Sharp's, gave Ken a better access to national attention and national acceptance. He could agree. He could sit with Ronald Reagan. He could sit with, with President Carter. He could be elected president of the National Conference of Mayors because, and I don't know if this is a positive, frankly, or a negative, he was less threatening. Yeah. Sharp James had that bombastic style. He played to a base here in Newark that he was going to go get what they needed. And of course, that's more threatening to those outside of Newark. Ken's style was not that. And he was able to get HUD to send hundreds of millions of dollars to Newark and to get other national commitments that I'm not sure what Sharp would ever have been able to do with his personality. So Ken, back to the historians, was I think for the times when Newark was in desperate need of that access to higher higher levels of government was the person for that job. Uh, he wasn't swinging uh, you know, an ax handle. He was out there talking like a uh, rational guy, asking for what he needed for his city. So were they, to a certain degree, they were kind of men of their time. I mean, in, uh, for the, what Newark needed at the time, do you think? Do you think yes. there was a difference between Ken and Sharp Chains? Yes, and I think that will signal in 1986, yeah. while Ken made a rather, uh, you know, it's like quiet <laughs> yeah, d d departure. Yeah. He, will, he spent his time. His time had passed. The city now needed a cheerleader. And Sharp was more, more of that, definitely so. Ken had played his, played his tune and it was over. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, Tom, could, uh, could we say something promotional about the New Jersey Information Center in terms of the, in terms of the uh, uh, photographs, the huge collection that we have online. Maybe Beth could speak to that. Beth is more familiar with, with all that yeah, we work. Have, yeah, we have. Uh, I mean, we. Um, I think you. You did you did you two use? Um, did you do, do do any research at the Newark Public Library when you were putting the book together? Um, I mean, I, it was more, more contributors you used, but we have a very large collection of photos and other materials. We also have a large digital. Um, and we're, we're going to be doing um, well, sessions about that later, Zoom sessions and other sessions about the, uh, the collections of the, uh, oh, the new okay. library. So. Yeah, we, were we looked to the library for uh, mm. uh, uh, information, background information, uh, pictures in, the, uh, wow. in the volume, uh, largely drawn <laughs> from um, uh, services provided by George Harley at, uh, at, the, at the library that were mm. uh, uh, very, very helpful to our to our effort to present uh, uh, new both pictorially as well as in writing. Bob? No, that's exactly right. I would not have gotten anywhere with the photos but for the help of George Hawley, and we acknowledge that uh, in, in the book among the acknowledgments, and we're very grateful and very thankful for, for their contribution to, uh, to the volume. The city in of fact, city I would ask, I want to ask George, do, do we have a copy to you yet? Do we, we need to get you copies signed by Richard and I of the book. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. I would appreciate that. Thank you. We, we, we have copies in the collection, but I don't right. think they're signed. I have actually one of, one of our copies in front of me, but it's not signed. So we'd love to get you guys to sign them. At some we, point. I will promise to get with Richard. We will get those. And to, yeah. Beth, and to Beth as well. 
we, we we also put the link in the chat if anybody wants to view the digital collection. It's it's in the chat. Oh, oh so thank you, Ben. We, we also looked at the New Jersey Historical Society for uh, uh, written assistance uh, from materials that we might draw on, and and the city's archive. Um, both were very instrumental and helpful, along with the library. Oh, great! I, I've always I've always been surprised as why no one really studied the role of the business community from the time of the change in government in 54 to the time when Ken took office and Sharp and so on. Because the, the role of the business community, I having, having worked with them for about five years, uh, was really quite significant, especially during the Carlin administration. And, and the role of, of these groups and Trenton had an organ organization of businessmen. And I think Camden did for a while and so forth. And uh, the one in Newark, I mean, I'm familiar with it enough because I worked there, but I, I think they were very, very significant in, in Carlin's uh, period. Sam, do you, th do you think they were concerned about the election of uh, African-American as mayor? Uh, no. It, it, notwithstanding the fact that no, they, Adonisio uh, was about to go to jail. Well, no, they they were supporting supporting Ken. Actually, uh -huh. they they knew what what about the city and the city's changing, and they, I mean, they all knew about Adonisio. They've had experiences with him, and so forth. Yeah, they did. They did step forward once he was elected and help with. Uh, with his staffing, they provided. Um, well, I worked for him. You know, the day, the day after he was elected, because I knew Norman Schiff, who was his his chief counsel, and and Norman had told him about me working at the business community. He called me the next day and invited me to come down and and serve as his, uh, basically, for lack of a better word, a chief of staff, in 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 his in his uh, in the mayor's office. And I was there for about, I guess, a year and a half or two years. When there, in, in Bob's book uh, on Newark, there are a couple of stories that I, I give you as to why I left. But yeah, uh, well, I, I think the business community initially was uh, under the impression that uh, that Ken would be in in a way responsive to their leadership that they were in charge and that he was going to preside as mayor. Well, he, he, wait, hold on, I think, I think. I think, uh, I, I say you're, you're right. I think that's a good point. I, I, I think uh, Al Coffey in the volume, in his reflections uh -huh. indicates that gradually the business community leadership came to the conclusion that they had to treat Ken as if he were a CEO, as they were CEOs, and that they were equal, they were partners, but they were equal partners in advancing the interests of the city of Newark. Yeah, I think and that began to unfold after they got a better sense of who this guy, the engineer, Ken Gibson, was. Yeah, I think I think you're, you're that way too. He saw himself right. as a partner, right? Yeah, I yeah. wasn't. I wasn't working with the business community then, but. They asked me every once in a while to come over and, and chat and because they knew I still had some some hands in the in the Newark community and which which they didn't, which is one of the reasons why I went to work for them. Yeah. Was to try to get them to recognize that, you know, what they were concerned with in downtown wasn't really doing anything in the neighborhoods. And and what I went to work for them and tried to, to make some changes. That was that was my role. But uh, I, I no, I think they, they, they knew about Adonisio from day one. They, they were ready uh, to get rid of him. Yeah, well, Alan, Alan Lowenstein had, had, had written a, um, a paper. I don't think this is any tales out of school, but a, a paper in terms of uh, how much money uh, he had going in and who some of his supporters were. And wow. In the business community, had to had to watch out for this and so forth, so, and they they were they were not happy. With that. <coughs> I mean, they 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 got him to do a couple of things, like taking over the old mosque theater. Uh, that was the first thing Adnizio agreed upon with the business community, and uh, I was still there then, and, and uh, uh, 
That was then changed to Symphony Hall. Is that the mosque that you were yeah, yeah, that was the mosque theater. And it was, yeah. The, the city bought it. And it was, so, yeah, I was still there in 61. I was working so, for the mayor then. Er, early, earlier, um, Bob, you were talking about the term Gibson University, which comes up a number of times in the book. Can you both <laughs> talk a little more about that? The whole, the whole idea of Gibson University. <laughs> Well, Richard started the uh, thought just a moment ago when he said that Ken very deliberately and systematically recruited young talent from across the nation, from uh, the Harvard, Yales, Princeton's, and other places. Uh, and he was deliberate in his effort to bring young talent into the city. And clearly, because we had very little, if any, hardline experience, we were in a learning curve, obviously. We were there to do what he asked us to do, but we had a giant learning curve. So to me, we were still we were still being educated. And fortunately, there were some other folks around, the, the Gus Henningbergs, uh, I could think of a few who we looked to, some of the older guys, to help us on that learning curve. Uh, but that's why I think of it as part of my, my educational process. Hmm. I, I think the, the important the point to make here is that these were the, the people that Ken attracted because he was the first African-American mayor of a major northeastern city, um, those people came to Newark with skills, but little, if any, experience leading major uh, agencies and organizations. Uh, Gibson allowed them to demonstrate that they indeed could perform and could perform at a very high level in uh, these important positions. And he listened to what they had to say. He took their advice. He implemented yeah. the policies and the programs that these people uh, uh, proposed, uh, presented to him. So that, that was an environment in which both uh, Ken got a benefit, but the, uh, the young people who were recruited to the city also got a major benefit. And then some of these people were very young. Some of them were right out of college, right? Or right out of- 22, 23, 24. The yeah. average average age of the young people is something like 25 years of age. The older, right. I think, Bob, you you and I may have been among the oldest. <laughs> I, I thought I was 26. We're right there with you. That's where we were. Yep. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, so what was, what was the impact in the, in the community about hiring people from out of town? Because I think when Booker tried to do that, he got a lot of heat uh, and brought in a lot of people. He he was he was very much uh, vilified for that. We can in interestingly, that. I don't think there was a, a lot of pushback about uh, the Can't. young people who were being who were being brought into the administration and given responsible position. At that time, folk were more interested in seeing what the administration could accomplish. In large measure, the expectations of Newarkers uh, on Gibson's election were alike the expectations in the African-American community across the country at the election of Barack Obama as president. They were interested in seeing results, seeing what could be accomplished to change, to make, to open up government uh, to Latinx and African-American residents. Uh, to, put, to allow poor people to participate in the city's economy. Those were the issues that, that concerned um, Newarkers at that time. And I, I think they were less concerned about where you came from, although it didn't hurt to be a minority or a, 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 a low income, with a low income background. But the real issue was what could you do for us once you got here? And I guess to Sam's question, while we were coming from out of town, some of us were coming back to town. I wasn't from Newark. I was from Elizabeth, but I had half my family lived in Newark. So I could say, you know, Uncle, Uncle Lot, and everybody knew who my family was. Sheila Oliver was from here. Vicki Donaldson was from here. George Hampton was from here. The, some of the people who were coming from the, the colleges, uh, coming, they were coming back to the community. So it wasn't quite carpetbagger. Uh, intrusion that uh, might have been the, the, the thought, the way it was described a moment ago. Except that the, the, the white people who came into the That's city right. were not Newarkers. <laughs> they they, well, were, they that, were very new to Newark. That's well, true. And that, and that criticism has gone right. on and, and, and goes on to this day. That That's can right. perhaps 
overloaded on that particular side of the of the ledger. Yes, that's, that's true. You're absolutely right. What about the uh, academic community? I, I saw uh, Steve Diner, the uh, former chancellor of Rutgers, Newark, join. Uh, uh, Richard you said that you had worked for Ralph Dungan. He was he had been pushing the Council for Higher, Higher Education in Newark, saying you've got these five institutions publicly supported in Newark. Uh, they should be working together. But was the academic community, uh, since you were, you know, you know, young people starting out needing some guidance, was it? Well, when, I came back, when I came back, when I came to Newark after, after getting my degree at Princeton, I came to work for something called the Office of Newark Studies, an uh -huh. entity that was created by uh, New Jersey foundations, the, what was called the Wallace Algebra Foundation, the Schumann Foundation, the Victoria Foundation, to provide a, pla a place where people who wanted to contribute to the city's revitalization, who had skills, expertise, um, but did not want to work for the city bureaucracy, could use the Office of Newark Studies as uh, uh, a base uh, in terms of providing support and assistance to the city. That entity was housed in the Rutgers University administration. It was the Office of Newark Studies and uh, a, a, uh, a member of the mayor's cabinet, but administered for the city of, of Newark by Rutgers University. That was a small but important step in building a relationship between Rutgers and the city of Newark. The other institutions were not actively involved, but Rutgers early on was, primarily through the Office of Newark Studies. And then over the years, uh, because of ONS's involvement, the business school, the Rutgers Business School got involved through Horace DePardlin, the dean of the, of the business school, who chaired the task force that uh, proposed the establishment of a pilot for the state of New Jersey, a payment in lieu of taxes to municipalities with state-owned property. He designed that and it was administered, the program was designed through the Office of Newark Studies and the Task Force. So the relationship between Rutgers and Newark goes back to 1968-69 and continues much more uh, today. There has been a flowering of that relationship in the last five to seven years, five to eight years. Richard, when did the leadership, the Newark Leadership Program come into being? 1971. Jack Crosscroft was recruited from the city of Cleveland, where he had been working as the uh, uh, as an aide to the mayor of Cleveland, uh, Carl Stokes, the first black mayor of that city. Uh, Jack came and became director, was appointed director of the Office of Newark Studies, recruited in part by uh, by uh, uh, Bob Curvin. But, but there was a, the leadership program was very significant too because it brought in so many uh, uh, business people into learning about Newark and about government in generally and, and, how, and how things work. Yeah, that was uh, Bob, uh, not Bob, uh, 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 fellow from Mutual Benefit, Van Fossen. Bob, Bob Van Fossen. Bob, Bob Van Fossen, um, uh, McNaughton at Prudential, yeah. uh, Bob Beck, all of those guys were very helpful. Uh, in fact, they were instrumental in getting, um, uh, providing Newark's first business administrator who served for um, an extended period of time. He was on loan from uh, one of the major corporations. Yeah. That's a very significant program, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, Richard, you have another meeting at two o'clock. Is that? Yes, I do. Another Zoom yeah, so meeting. I, I yeah. think we're. I think we're going to have to uh, uh, quits here. But thank you, everyone, for showing up, and thank, thank you. you. This was a terrific program. This was this real, 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 well, This was for my me, first it was a, for me, it was Zoom a book talk. Thing. <laughs> well, what did you say, Sam? I didn't hear that. I said, for me, it was a delight. Thank you very much. Oh, well, really... I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, well, I'm you all for joining. Program. A really few familiar program. faces. <laughs> Thank you, Bob and Richard, for um, agreeing to be here and to have this talk. And um, and if you are looking for a book to buy, if you haven't read it yet, oh, it doesn't, oh, it doesn't show up in my, my bag. <laughs>
I can't say anyway, but but so it's the book is a mayor for all the people. Kenneth Gibson's Newark by Robert C. Holmes and Richard W. Roper, okay. University Press. Thank you very, very much. much for taking Our pleasure. Part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It was fun.